Greetings, my sisters and brothers. Welcome to another segment of our Black History Month. Today with me again is Dr. Renoko Rashidi, and he will be presenting to us some of our African queens and pioneers. So once again, uh, Dr. Rashidi, I welcome you warmly. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a delight to be here. I'm beginning to feel like a regular, a regular cast member. And that's a good thing. Today in particular, because we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, and that is Black women in history. Um, I'm a historian. I think a lot of the listeners know that. They may know a little bit about me. I'm an anthropologist, an author. I travel constantly. And this is Black History Month. So normally this would be the busiest time of year for me. But what I find myself doing is uh, working on Zoom and WebEx and StreamYard, et cetera, et cetera. And so today we talk about Black women in history, particularly the queens. So let's get right to it. We don't have a lot of time. I'm going to show a handful of photographs, and we'll see how it goes. Now, this is the queen that I was initially asked about. <clears throat> My sister contacted me and uh, mentioned this, uh, Nzinga, sometimes called Ann Nzinga, and asked if I could do a, a brief presentation about her. Naturally, I jumped on it. I did have a reservation because a lot of the photographs that I showed, the vast majority of them are original photographs. That means I took the pictures myself. I don't have any real original photos of Nzinga, although I admire her. She is from this sister who was born about oh, 1550 and died about 1640 or so. She had lived a ripe old life, I think well into her 80s. Uh, she converted to Christianity early in her life, and she spent the latter part of her life fighting against the Portuguese, who were trying to expand the enslavement of African people, particularly in Central Africa. And this statue of her, beautiful statues in Luanda, Angola. Angola is not an easy place for African Americans or people with U.S. passports to get to. The visa process is a little cumbersome, and it's very expensive. But we have to acknowledge Nzinga anyway. She is one of the most important figures in our history. And as a man who loves Black women, loves to honor them, I think it's appropriate that we do spend time with her. So let me show you three of the images that I do have. Here's the statue in Luanda. And I'm going to be very cognizant of the time. I'm only going to, I'm going to be very brief. And then here's, I believe that this is from a book, I believe called Women Leaders in African History by a man named David Sweetman. I believe that's where I got this photograph from. And there's a famous story of a meeting that she had with the Portuguese, uh, some Portuguese dignitaries, and the Portuguese um, wanted to have a psychological advantage. So they came to the meeting place before Nzinga's uh, entourage got there and um, removed all the chairs, except the ones that the uh, Portuguese envoy was going to sit in. And that would make Nzinga have to stand in their eyes. That would have given them a sense of psychological, um, psychological advantage that this Black woman is made to stand in the presence of this white Portuguese uh, man. And so as soon as Nzinga and her people walked into place, they automatically sensed what was going on. So one of her attendants bent over and, and became Nzinga's throne, became Nzinga's chair. This is a famous episode in her life. And then this is a lithograph of her. I believe this was done by a Frenchman, I think in 1828. I actually saw this, uh, this lithograph, but either I couldn't photograph it or I wasn't able to photograph it or I didn't have a camera. This was in the Schomburg Library in Harlem. And I doubt if this is what the sister actually looked like. I don't think they had jerry curls in the Congo and, Anzola, and Angola in the 16th century, but she's still a beautiful black woman. Now, what I want to do is go back quickly to the cradle of civilization and look at African queens in the valley of the Nile and how updated even into modern times. This takes us to ancient Egypt, the place we call Kemet, 
And this is one of my favorite images from the pyramid age, from the fourth dynasty, about 2550 BC, about 4,500 years ago. And this is a pyramid building named Menkare or Menkara, and its significant other, Kamer or Nepti, uh, the second. We say in American society and perhaps in the Caribbean too, that behind every great man, there's a woman. But I think in the traditional African sense, the woman and man complemented each other. There wasn't a sense of inferiority or superiority. And you can see the balance here. I love how tenderly she's holding this man as if to say nothing is gonna happen to you on my watch. And there's a sense of serenity. I think this is very, very important in terms of imagery. Images are very, very important. It's been said that he who controls the image controls the mind. And so I want to start with there. This is in Boston. And this is actually in Cairo, in the big uh, the Egyptian museum in Egypt itself. And then we go down the dynasties. I always try to start at the beginning and work my way through. And again, I'm only going to show a, photo, a few. Uh, you have to have me back for a fuller presentation. I do hope that everybody will enjoy this. This takes us to the 11th dynasty. And this is about 4,000 years ago. And this is the first time during this dynastic period that I know of where the color black begins to be used in a ritualistic fashion. The color black denoted rejuvenation, regeneration, renewal. It could even be argued that at this time, the color black began to represent the color of God. And this is a queen from the 11th dynasty. And then Kemet or Egypt undergo, undergoes an invasion by a group of people, foreigners called the uh, Hiskos. It means something like the uh, rulers of foreign lands or the desert kings, the shepherd kings. And the Africans lost control of their country. They lost control of Egypt. And gradually, over a period of time, they began to regroup. We could call this Africa's first national liberation struggle. And a part of that struggle were women. They play very prominent roles. This woman right here that you see portrayed back to back is in the 13th or 14th dynasty, somewhere in that vague period. We don't have clear written records, and her name is Nubkes. And this is a beautiful piece. This is in the Musée du Louvre in Paris. And one of the things that I'm able to do when I share these uh, visual presentations with you is I'm able to share and show off my museum trophies. I think that museums have enough information, enough artifacts to really reconstruct the entire history of the Black community of the world. And this is another one similar, but a little later. The woman in the center, seated back to back, her name is Tetsusheri. And Tetsusheri was one of the great liberation fighters during this period of time. Now we're at about 3,600 years ago. And this is in her tomb. And she is surrounded on both sides by her grandson, a man named Amos I. And he is honoring his grandmother, Tetsusheri. The most important thing to keep in mind in ancient Egypt is how well respected the woman was. Uh, she could inherit fortunes. She could bring suits to the courts of law. You dared not disrespect her. Perhaps the worst thing that you could do as a form of etiquette was to disrespect your mother. And I would say that the major reason the Nile Valley civilization lasts so long, thousands and thousands of years, is the close family relationships. So here she is in the center being honored by her grandson. And this is her daughter. Now this woman's name is Ahotep. And this is a golden coffin of her in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. And uh, this woman actually led troops into battle, if you can believe that, actually led troops into battle. Her name is Ahotep. And then the granddaughter, a third great member of that family from the female uh, perspective, is a woman named Amos Nefertari. Now, Amos Nefertari, in many ways, is the most significant of all three of these. She is painted black. She was deified during her lifetime. A special set of prayers were devoted for her worship that lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years. And she is very, very important. Her name is Amos Nefertari. So you have three generations 
a very powerful African queens during this particular period. And Amos Nefertari in particular was the queen when the uh, foreign invaders of Kemet were kicked out of the country. And here she is again, and yet another one. And generally she's painted black. When you're painted black, that means you were particularly important because we know that the people themselves were black, but black also has a symbolic element to it. And I've already talked about that just a bit. Now this is her granddaughter. And this is maybe, I say this every time I show one, maybe the most powerful of them all. This woman's name is Makare Hapshetsu. Hapshetsu, she was the daughter of a king. She married a king and she herself became a king. Traditionally, the line, the line of descent is traced and came through the, feet, through the female side of the family. You have a matrilineal line of descent. However, it was the male who was traditionally the king. But in order for the male to be the king, he had to marry the woman in whom the royal bloodline ran. But now and then, in times of danger and duress, in a, in a quest for national stability, sometimes a woman could rise to be the head of state, the pharaoh, literally a female king. And here she is in the form of a sphinx, which had the body of a lion and the head of a king. And this is her temple. This is not her tomb. This is a temple uh, where her memory was perpetuated. And this is at a place called Dur el Bari. And you can see the temple carved out of the cliffs of uh, the city of Luxor, just across the Nile. This is beautiful. And every time I take a group there, we always go here. I've been to Egypt 25 times. I take my next group on August the 1st, if anybody's interested. And at the end of the month, I do a webinar on Zoom on the Nile Valley. I'll give my contact information at the end of the presentation if you want to partake. Now, here she is again. All these are Hapshetsu. And now this is about 3,500 years ago. She reigned for 20 years. And then a little later comes another woman named the Lady Tuya, T-U-Y-A. And I just like this, to be honest with you, because of the hair. I'm not gonna lie, I love to see black women with natural hairstyles. And this is the Lady Tuya, but she is not nearly as important as her daughter, whose name is Queen Tai. She married the King of Egypt when she was only about 15. They were teenagers and they fell in love. Here in Egypt, people actually fell in love. They had romantic relationships. The Greeks thought that was a form of insanity. Anyway, this is Queen Tai, and she married a man named Amenhotep III. And these are all images of Queen Tai. I could do a whole presentation just on her. Look at this one. It's a bit like you, sister, Kareen. <laughs> Her daughter-in-law, Nefertiti, we've all heard of Nefertiti. I'm almost done. And this is a woman named Amenirtis the first. She is called the first wife of Amen. And it's from the name Amen that we get the expression, amen. And we believe that, here she is again. This woman's name is Pradonk. And she's not so important for what she accomplished. She is important to us because of the son that she bore. This is the mother of a man named Imhotep. Imhotep is the world's first scientist, first multi-genius. And this is his mama. She was uh, elevated to a, a deified-like state 2,000 years after her death. And then this one takes us to another kingdom in the Valley of the Nile. And this is from a place called Meroe in what is now Sudan in Nubia. And here you can see uh, a queen mother called a Kandaka, surmounted by these two female aspects of God. I love this. This is made of sandstone. This is in Boston. And finally, I wanted to just end up by showing you, I think, four or five images of African freedom fighters in modern times. That is what a lot of us think of in Zynga as an African freedom fighter, a warrior queen who kept or tried to keep the integrity of Africa, tried to prevent her people from being enslaved, spent 50 years 
of her life in that struggle. Well, you've always had black women play that role, even in the Caribbean, and that's where we're gonna end. This, for example, is a statue in Mantanzas province, Cuba, of a woman named Carlotta Lukimi. Carlotta led a revolt in uh, Matanzas province, Cuba in 1843. One of the things that we must keep in mind, perhaps the most important thing, is that wherever injustice and oppression has existed, resistance comes about. You cannot have, you will not have one without the other. And if we're gonna talk about the enslavement of African people, let us not just see ourselves as victims. We wanna be able to talk about how we resisted that, how we tried to keep the family together, how under the most difficult odds, we tried to maintain a level of human dignity. And women were always involved in that process. They did not take a back seat. They were not subordinate. And so this is Carlotta Lukami. I love this statue right here. And this one takes us to um, um, Guadalupe. And this is a sister who apparently was, as I understand it, was born out of a rape on a slave ship and who participated in the liberation movement in Guadalupe, which took place at the same time as the Haitian Revolution. And then here is a piece from Suriname and there's a similar one in St. Martin. You know, I was in St. Martin about 15 years ago. I look forward to going back. One of the reasons I enjoy uh, these interactions is because I want to um, restore my memory in the minds of the people of this part of the Caribbean when the pandemic stops, whenever that is. I like to go back and visit and lecture and share. I have a lot to share. This is a woman named Alida. And the Dutch um, could be very cruel in the enslavement process. And one of the things that they would do, and this is a historical fact, was cut off the breast of rebellious African women. And that's what we have here. This is a woman named Alida who survived and went into the bush and gave birth to the greatest freedom fighters in the history of Suriname. And there's your shooting in front of one of those statues. One of the things that makes me feel good when I'm doing these historical overviews is the ability to say, I was there, I've seen it. This isn't just something I did a Wikipedia a search on or YouTube, but I've actually been able to see much of what I'm talking about. So in this brief period, 15, 20 minutes, however much time we've spent, what we tried to do is look at African women in the ancient world and also the modern world as freedom fighters, as mothers, as patriots, as queens, and even as kings. I don't think as a black man, I could ever utter enough praise to black women. The tongue could stiffen in my mouth and I would still be singing the praises of black women. We love you. We think, and I'm a strong black man with a strong voice. We think you are important. We value you. We need you. Without you as black men, we are nothing. And I think that that's something that our sisters desperately need to hear. And so that's my testimony for today. Amen. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Renoko. A great presentation. Sister, Indeed. let me just add, let me just add, for those who want to contact me, please, you can always uh, email me at renoko at hotmail mail.com are you in okay oh at hotmail.com i'll go to my .com. But i want to thank you sister for the wonderful work that you're doing and you are the personification of the queens that i just share with you success uh, everyone yeah. have a wonderful day thank you sister thank you so much and i know that this will be a blessing to all of us uh, especially uh, those whom i will be sharing it with Okay then, take care and God bless.